O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock, and you certainly are our redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. In William Brown's introduction to seeing the Psalms, he writes of the Psalms, if not the theological center of the Old Testament, the Psalter is at least Scripture's most integrated corpus. On David's many string lyre, as it were, there can be heard almost every theological chord that resounds throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. From covenant and history to creation and wisdom. In the Psalms, the God who commands is also the God who sustains. The God of royal pedigree and the God of the poor and needy. The God of judgment and the God of healing. God's hidden face and God's beaming countenance. All are profiled in the Psalter. Everyone who has ever shared with me their love of the Psalms did so with a glow that came over their faces. They, in their own way, each told me somehow, it's all in there. From anger to adulation, the various psalms run the gamut of human emotion and response to God's presence in the world or lack thereof. Personally, I believe that the Psalms contain a lot. First of all, because there's a lot of Psalms. However, for me, the, the lyrics of the Psalms never quite leapt off the pages of Scripture as they did for so many of my friends. I don't know about you, but I, have, I had found the, the Psalms to be inaccessible. Now, there are two related or unrelated experiences which occurred many years apart that have opened my eyes anew and my heart to the book of Psalms. One year, Carmen and I, we were, we were newly married. We decided to go on a vacation. We had never been to the Thousand Islands before, but we saw pictures of it and said, you know, it's really not, that too, really not too far away, and so we went to the Thousand Islands. We did all the touristy things. We walked into the shops, and, and we, you know, we went to Boat Castle. Anyone ever been to Boat Castle? Oh, my goodness, it's awesome. There. I even saw... I didn't write this in my sermon. I even saw a graffiti that was over a hundred, about a hundred years old. That just impressed me. <laughs> but at one point, what we did is we took a tour, a boat tour of the St. Lo the St. Lawrence River, and we're going around all of these various uh, uh, islands, and and we're listening to the history of of, of what of who lived there, and and all of that sort of thing. And at one point, one of the, uh, the tour guides walked by me and I said, I, I have a question. I, I have a question. How deep, how deep is this water? Now, I was expecting a number. What I was not expecting was a little geography lesson. The attendant looked at me and says, well, it really depends. It all depends where you're at. Because the, the bottom of the river has, you know, has peaks and valleys. It's, that There's places where it's incredibly shallow and, and others where it's very deep. I want you to hold in your mind for a little bit the response that was given to me. It depends where you are. We're at a picnic this morning. Turn to your neighbor and say, it depends where you are. Turn, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> it 
1995, Walter Brueggemann, one of the most prolific uh, biblical scholars of our time, one of my favorite personally, published a commentary entitled Psalms and the Life of Faith. The well-seasoned Brueggemann argued for a shift in the way that the church read the Psalms. For about the past 200 years, we tended to read the Psalms mostly caring, caring about the way that they were structured. You go find an old commentary, and that's exactly what they do. It's kind of boring, actually. But Brueggemann, in, nine, in, the, in the 90s, encouraged us as a church to focus more on the way that the Psalms function. The Psalms, whether individual or communal, were a response to where these people, faithful people, were at the time in their lives, in their relationship with God. To better capture the ups and the downs of real life, Brueggemann suggested putting each Psalm in one of three places. Orientation disorientation, new orientation. A place of orientation refers to those moments when life is good. It's safe and, and predictable. There are plenty of psalms that share this expression of a person whose life, who enjoys life as it is right now. An example of an orientation, or orientation psalm is found in Psalm 104, where the psalmist observes the animal world and says, these all look to you to give them food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. In the psalms of orientation, we know our place in the world. We see and recognize the revealed will of God to us. We, and we carry our lives trusting in God's goodness. This is the place of orientation. A place of disorientation refers to those moments when life is distressing. And the world that you once knew is gone. And there are plenty of psalms that are full of resentment and protest where people cry out to God in anger and confusion and the emotions and the language are raw. This is where we find the lyrics of Psalm 22 which were re-uttered by Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the place where a family right now I, I deeply care about. Having lost two grandparents in less than a month, a little boy looked up to his mom and asked just yesterday, does God hate me? This is the place of disorientation. A place of new orientation. So we have the place of orientation, disorientation. The, the third place is the place of new orientation. And it refers to the realization that God has already delivered the psalmist from the trouble that had threatened to undo him or her. I mean, there are plenty of psalms sung in a major key with an upbeat tempo declaring for one and all who God is and what God has already accomplished. These psalms are sung on the solid foundation of a heart that has been renewed in God's love and grace. And you will notice in the back of your, or in the back of the book of Psalms, this is where many of these psalms are create, or, 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 or gathered. The songs of unabandoned praise to God, like Psalm one thirty six, 
where the liturgist proclaims, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. And in unison, the congregation would answer, His love endures forever. This, this is the place of new orientation. When, I read, when we read the Psalms, it would be wise for us to determine their placement as Psalms of orientation, disorientation, or new orientation. But in my opinion, it is equally important to know where you or I are personally in life and in faith when we engage the Psalms. In Psalm 107, the liturgist begins, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. The liturgist calls the faith community to order from every direction of the compass. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Our communion liturgy is a beautiful example of what happens in Psalm 107. With the congregation, they know their part. They know their lines. In our passage this morning, the psalmist provides four instances when God's people found themselves in a place of disorientation. And four instances when God reached down and lifted the people up from their place of disorientation into a new orientation. In other words, by God's amazing grace, these folks are not where they used to be. And in my imagination, when the psalmist began to speak, all of a sudden everyone in the congregation heard Franny Crosby's old hymn playing in their mind. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Back in the day, Back in the darkness of disorientation, some of them had wandered into the desert wastelands and literally watched their lives ebb away from hunger and thirst. And with their strength gone, their ribs showing and their stomachs bloated, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. We all need, we all need someone that we can call in case of an emergency. At the beginning of every semester at Emory University, I am required to update my emergency contacts. This is what the priests and the prophets of the Old Testament were always doing. They're updating Israel's emergency contacts, reminding them to call upon the name of the Lord. And so they did. They did. And we don't know the length of time that elapses, but we do know that the Lord heard their cry and delivered them from their distress. In my youth, I spent a lot of my time... I love that smell, by the way. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my youth hiking and climbing around down in the Niagara Gorge. Almost every day. We loved it down there as a family. And, and I remember one summer day, it was a really hot day. I remember this because my friend Dave had called and said, Nick, do you want to go hiking in the gorge? And I said, absolutely. We roll up to the gorge. He has a purple Camaro. It was the coolest car ever. Dark purple Camaro. We rolled up, and it was so hot, I did something I never had done before. I took off my shirt in public. (laughs) Dave did the same thing. He cracked down the windows just a little bit on his Camaro. He hid the key for the ignition in the car. He locked the doors and then gave me the key, just a single key to hold on to. Well, we went hiking. He was wearing soccer shorts. I had pockets. We were hiking around the gorge. It's incredibly hot. We're, we're, you know, we're sweating like crazy. We absolutely are having a great time. We're talking. We're laughing. We're climbing. We're doing all of these things. And then we come to a spot. And Dave said, what I, Nick, 
Get, get a couple of stones. Get a couple of rocks. I go, why? He goes, there's a spot right up here. If we just climb up here, there's a spot right up here where we can throw the rocks and try to hit the rainbow bridge. I had never done that before. And Dave began to walk ahead. He had some rocks and he walked ahead. Meanwhile, I'm like, I'm going to hit the bridge, you know. And it's, I'd probably get arrested now if I did that. Anyway. <laughs> And so I fill up my pockets and, and I catch up to Dave. I climb up and I catch up to Dave. And, you know, he's throwing rocks like that. I'm reaching in my pocket and I'm throwing rocks as fast and as hard as I can. Dave ran out of stones. He didn't have as many as I did. And he began to wander up a little further. And so I just started throwing as hard and as fast as I possibly could. And then all of a sudden, something felt a little different. <laughs> And I couldn't stop. And I, wa and I tried to, and I watched Dave's key for his Camaro <laughs> plummet. <laughs> I said, Dave, ah, Dave, I just threw your key over the gorge. And he looked at me as if I were joking. I I'm not kidding. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Panic just took over. I don't know what happened in those next couple of moments. But all of a sudden, I hear Dave yell, Nick, don't kill yourself. And when he said that, I found, I looked, I realized where I was. I was on the edge of the gorge. My feet were dangling. I was hanging on. I swear to you, I was hanging on to, to, to the roots of weeds. And all of a sudden, I began to realize that they were, up, they were coming up. Nick, don't kill yourself. I don't know how I got from that spot, or from where I was to that spot. All I know is that if I would have fallen, that would have been it for me. The next thing I know is I'm back on solid ground. The next thing I know is that the next time I find myself reading the scripture, it read a little differently. The next time I started singing these songs of, of worship and love to God, they, they, they took on a whole new meaning because of my new orientation. God heard the cries of those wandering in the desert wasteland. God heard the cries according to the liturgist of those shackled and Babylonian holding cells. Of those on the brink of death and the cries of those tossed by a stormy sea. And in these disorienting experiences, we are informed again and again. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. You know, when we share our story, we reflect on who and where we used to be, lost in the desert, in prison, sick, at the mercy of a storm, our feet dangling above the gorge. But the gospel message, the good news, is that the God who heard the cry of the slaves in Egypt delivered them. The God who heard the cry of Jesus from the cross delivered him. And if history is any indicator, the God who heard their cries hears ours as well. Some days, some days the Psalms of New Orientation will fall flat on our ears. We might question the reality of God's love or even God's goodness. But then there are those times when the Psalms of New Orientation speak of the joy and the excitement of the God who delivered us from our trouble. And it is my prayer that this week you will find one Psalm, one Psalm, that speaks the language of your heart. 
and reclaim it as your prayer to God. It is my hope that for those for whom the Psalms of New Orientation resonate this morning, that you would lead the church verbalizing and embodying the goodness of the Lord in such a way that it invites and encourages others to sing with full hearts that the Lord's love endures forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.